So today I have Justin O'Connell from Century 21 joining me. Justin, thanks for jumping on. No worries, Ashley. So the reason why I've asked you is because I want you to give a real inside sense to uh, in interstate investors that are looking to buy in Perth. And I refer my clients looking north of the river to you. You're a very sort of high performing um, in volume real estate agent. I like the way you work. I deal with a lot of real estate um, sales agents and um, and you stand out as a real decent sales rep. So thank you for being one of those people. Thank you, Ashley. Um, and I just want to talk through a couple of maybe the more difficult um, questions um, that the buyers have and just to get your answer and your feedback from them so that these buyers sort of understand um, where you're coming from as well and it can help them have a smooth purchase um, and help them um, just buy a lot easily and also have some good trust in the sales process as well because obviously in WA um, the selling process is very different. I do my best to try and educate them as much as possible um, which hopefully makes it a little bit easier um, for you guys as well and um, the education side of things I just think is really important. So I'm going to start off just with a couple of questions for you. Um, now you is is this probably one of the busiest seasons you've seen in the real estate market with interstate buyers? Like are you experiencing the same as what I'm experiencing? Yes, definitely. Um, we had a bit of a run on. Um, it's probably going to show my age here, but the in 2006 through to about sort of 2007, um, we saw a lot of eastern states based investors come into our market. And uh, we've always had a trickle of them coming through, but then they kind of dropped off there for a fair bit. Um, but yeah, in the last couple of years in particular, they've really shown a lot of interest in WA and I can understand why. That's, um, Do you yeah. find, are they um, like all price points or is there a certain hot price bracket? Yeah, there's definitely some more popular property demographics. And, you know, for us in our area, it seems to be um, the things that are between three and 500 are very popular. And uh, and then, but there are people that will buy sort of all sorts of property demographics as well. So, you know, sometimes we get apartments under 300,000, um, but then sometimes we get more mid-range properties that investors will still look at because the rent returns are strong sort of across all property demographics. So they're looking at everything. Yeah. Um, talk to me about your off markets. Like why, and this might not necessarily be specific to you, but just, um, you know, for the real estate industry, um, off market listings, I get asked all the time, um, you know, we want an off market. And my thought is that um, going off market um, will, like there's not many of those opportunities around. So are you, how does your conversation look with your sellers when they decide, do I go off market or do I go to a home open? Like, what's the discussion on your end and why do you choose one option over another? Yeah, sure. Uh, usually if we go off market, it's probably because we've got tenants in situ. So, and um, those same properties that are popular demographics for the Eastern States-based investors are also popular demographics for owner-occupiers here. And so if we've got a tenant in situ, then quite often it won't really suit the owner occupiers. So if we put it on market, we'll get a lot of inquiry for people that the property is not suitable. So we're kind of just, it's a bit of a waste of everybody's time. So most of the time, if you see off market, we've probably got a tenant in situ that we're trying to find a new fit with a new landlord. And that's most of the time that we'll use that, that sale method. And these clients or buyers are purchasing it sight unseen? Yeah, they, they are. I mean, we, we try to set it up as well as what we possibly can. So, you know, wherever possible, we'll get the sellers to obtain a floor plan. Not always possible, but, but quite often it will be. Um, we've got a great little link that we send them to the local council that they can order online. It's not expensive for them. Um, so we set that up. I usually do a walkthrough video. So it's just a virtual inspection. It's not professional. It's not Steven Spielberg stuff, but it tends to give them a bit of an idea of what, what the property is like. Um, then we're happy to send them, obviously, the video. WhatsApp tends to be the best uh, uh, medium to send that on because they're quite a big file. Um, but then we send them all the additional photos that we've got, the copy of the title, then the floor plan. And that usually is enough information for those people to purchase sight unseen. Yeah. If 
like I'm getting a lot of distress from buyers where they are just missing out on the opportunity sort of to have a look. Um, and your market at the moment, I mean, there's there's probably properties that are selling same day within a couple of days. Like, is it as hot again as what I'm experiencing? Are you experiencing the same? Yeah, again, it's definitely some of that particular property demographic, you know, something we've got around sort of 500 square metres, give or take, um, that's between, say, that four to 500,000. Um, second, that goes out to the database off market, or if it goes on market, you're going to get a lot of inquiry. There will be people that will be prepared to make offers in a very short time frame. So you usually have to operate pretty quickly. And um, <clears throat> yeah, and you can be inundated a little bit with inquiry on them. And so it can be actually difficult to sort of get back to everyone in what they might consider to be a timely fashion, although we try our very best and, and we're usually pretty good at it. But yeah, but sometimes um, with some of those ones that are particularly hot, people have to be a little bit patient. Yeah. So that brings us into the communication piece and um, obviously people can contact um, sales reps through email, um, phone, SMS, they're probably the three main sources. Do you, like each, I know each agent has a different preference with it, but from your point of view, um, how does the communication side of, like what works for you and what doesn't work? Yeah, um, definitely email is probably number one because, yeah, I'm fastidious about making sure that I empty my inbox and so no one gets missed in email. Um, text message is probably the worst way to do business. Um, unfortunately, you just get bombarded um, with a lot of communication. Um, I mean, typically in a day, I would get somewhere between 50 to 80 emails a day, but I will clear them. Text, you can get sometimes 30 or 40, and then that's not even taking into consideration the phone calls you get, which can be sometimes you know up to 70 phone calls a day, which is a lot. And so um, definitely email, uh, I think, is 100% the way to go over text and but also calling doesn't harm and leaving a voicemail and you know, I'll always get back to everyone as well so yeah and I think like when we sort of spoke um off camera you know we talked about how you've got your family and your friends also sending text messages so then when you've got work things coming through it is easy for those messages to get lost and I know for me I'm the same as you like email is my to-do list I like the email to come through and I've been known you know on a Friday night to go through my text messages to work out who haven't I responded to and um and it's not a fast option so I guess that anyone that's listening a tip would be um when um trying to get hold of a sales rep um do be empathetic towards what they are dealing with because it's a it's a high volume of communication every day but if a mess if you do send an sms and you haven't got a response maybe instead of doing that again and, and being perceived as hassling a little bit just change it up maybe give that agent a phone call or send them through an email and um, recognize that they all have different preferred communication methods um, and maybe don't repeat the same one that would be my tip don't repeat the same communication method if it's not working for you try another one and that goes for all real estate agents sort of around um, around Australia um, and my um, my last thing that I just wanted to also talk about was marketing methods. So I'm getting a common question with sales um, with the buyers. We I was just going to ask, yeah, but from a from a marketing um, perspective, there's different types of styles that I'm seeing different agents around Perth doing. So they've got um, either pricing properties really, really low and then selling for 5 to 10% higher. And I explained to buyers that they're not overpaying 5 to 10%. It's actually a marketing method. Um, and then you've got traditional agents where they market at a pretty good, reasonable price. And sometimes it goes for more, but it can go around the asking price a little bit more. It could vary in different suburbs. So um, are you, do you sort of see the same thing, that agents have a different marketing method? Yeah, and sometimes. I, I think it's some the seller does dictate that somewhat um, because, yeah, it depends on their motivation. Like I will get sellers to say to me, I want to see offers this week. And mm -hmm. so we might pin it still as a private treaty method where we're putting a price on it, but going offers from, so we're not capping that price. But yeah. then if we think that 
maybe the property might sell around that 430k mark. If we went offers from 399, and we know it's definitely worth somewhere early to mid 400s, we're 100% going to see offers on it, and we'll probably still end up in that position. But we quite often will then get buyer competition. But then sometimes sellers will be a little less motivated in that regard. So, you know, they they might still want around the same price, but then they might want, you know, they'll just say, well, I don't mind if it takes a few weeks to sell. We don't necessarily have to see offers. So I do find that probably comes down to seller motivation a little bit. So it's probably not a bad thing to ask the agent. I don't mind people asking me, you know, what is their motivation? And then quite often, you know, we'll give them a pretty keen indication of, you know, why we've priced it the way we have, what our expectation might be. And uh, just give them, you know, a bit of an idea of, you know, where they might not need to be to be competitive. Yeah. Are you finding that um, you've got first home buyers, um, people that are living in the property, you've got your private investors, you've got your buyer's agents. So that'd probably be the, you know, obviously the three main categories. Do you find that either one of the categories are potentially like, I don't want to say overpaying, but are any of those three categories coming in the strongest with their offers? Um, you, you generally, sorry, just one second, power on. Uh, we're actually finding, I mean, traditionally investors have always been the most conservative in their approach with the price on properties because they've been the less motivated to buy. Um, but we are finding at the moment, um, because the affordability has maybe got away from those first home buyers of getting away from them a little bit. So um, so we're actually not really finding there's one particular demographic that's the most aggressive on prices. It probably comes down to that buyer motivation in that situation. So, you know, why do they need to purchase? And, you know, what's the situation? Are they getting kicked out of a rental after getting the home? Um, but also, yeah, I find with some investors, you know, they've been looking around for a while. They know what they're looking for they know roughly what they should be paying and you know if they see the right thing at the right price um, they kind of want to secure it so they might still go pretty hard on the price so yeah i wouldn't say there's one demographic more than others at the moment um, maybe traditionally yeah definitely owner occupiers were probably uh, because they were a bit more motivated to buy they would pay the highest prices but i'm finding it's pretty even mixed at the moment yeah, yeah, and I, I, I don't know whether you see it or not, but there's also some sellers that are more motivated to sell to a own occupier instead of an investor, regardless of the price to a certain extent. There's a little bit of that sentiment, yeah, because yeah. it's you know, they just feel for them. I mean, you know, it is tough out there to find a rental, and you know, and that's why the investors are looking at them because there's plenty of of uh, tenant competition and. You know, but uh, yeah, some we have had some sellers that have said, you know, they prefer to give it to someone sort of local that's going to live in it, make it a family home if it maybe was a family home for them prior to as well. So, a bit of a romantic notion that people still have it. Yeah. Yeah, we had one up your way. I can't remember um, if it was yours or someone else's, but they, um, the owner, the previous owner, called us up and said, if we'd known how much rent we would get for the property, we'd never would have sold it to an investor. They would have rented it out themselves. So I feel like there's a little bit of the thought that that investors are making money off their family home. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I get yeah. It. yeah, that's right. Yeah, but that's the market at the moment. What are your thoughts long-term with the markets? Do you still, still see it going strong or do you have any yeah. thoughts? Well, yeah, it's been an interesting year so far because I, I thought maybe with the interest rates creeping up that, you know, the intensity might have dropped off a little bit. We haven't seen it not in our area. And if anything, the stock levels are, you know, probably the lowest they've been in a couple of years for us. And so um, so when they do come on the market, it just seems like there's yeah, still plenty of interest in the properties. And so at the moment, I can't see it changing. I, I really can't see that vacancy rate changing. So I think the returns are still going to be there. And um, so I think the investors will still be keen. And because those vacancy rates are so lean, there's so many people that are trying to get out of that rent trap and try to get into the market. So, so yeah, there's sort of plenty of demand there. But, yeah, at the moment, the supply is a little bit lower than what we'd like. So... But um, so right now, I think it'll yeah, it'll still be pretty buoyant. It might be a bit competitive, um, but um, but yeah, like I said, from the investor perspective, the rent returns will be there. 
Yeah, excellent. Well, I really, really appreciate you coming on to um, give that little bit more extra insight to these investors. And if you um, are looking north of the river, whether it's buying or selling, um, Justin does do a fantastic job from Century 21. So get on his database. I tell everyone to get on their database. I assume, am I doing the right thing by just telling them to email you to get on the database or is there an easy way? Yeah, perfect. Um, Just send me an email. Uh, just include name, phone number, their email address and some rough parameters of what they're looking for or they can be very tight parameters if they want to. So we're only sending them the, the very definitive information that they want. But um, but yeah, 100%, if we get that email, um, we'll definitely be in touch from time to time. Perfect, yeah, because your data, you do work your database well better than sort of any others. So um, that's why I, I like yours because I know your email, if you've got off-market options, you do email with new stocks. So you do a great job. So thank you for that. Reach out to Justin if you're looking north of River. Um, that's like the Merrow with Clarkson and surrounding areas um, where all the activity is happening at the moment. Thank you, Justin. Thanks, Ashley. Cheers.